Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the first uh, lecture of the, of the semester, and actually the first lecture for me, as I did. So, <laughs> so I'm incredibly excited that this first lecture is uh, Ialis Weissmann's uh, lecture. And actually, I think the last time we saw each other, we were acting as orangutans for a, an experiment that you were doing in Istanbul uh, with <laughs> Matthew and Mark's, Mar Mark's biennial. Uh, and uh, it's, a, uh, it's all also been, it's a very important moment after two years and a half, two years of EILs not being allowed to come to the US and we're incredibly happy of the work that Tom Keenan did with Senate mobilizing senators and many other people to make this happen and we're incredibly honored that you're coming here in this first return to the US. Uh, this uh, session is being possible uh, and facilitated by uh, Laura Corgan and the program uh, in uh, computational design practices that was launched uh, earlier this year uh, incredibly successfully and I'm very happy. And this speaks a lot of the way this program is operating as a network of alliances and conversations with uh, uh, others. Uh, EL's work is incredibly important for architecture, and not only for architecture, it's brought uh, a materials perspective and aesthetic sensitivity to the political arenas in which truth is produced socially. And I think this is uh, not only uh, redefining architecture, not necessarily as buildings, but as networks of connections and alliances and, and conflicts and disputes between people other forms of life, objects. And for me, this perspective is incredibly important. Uh, and not only for me, obviously, not only for our fields, but also for the way that uh, we understand politics as societies now across the world. And for this, I'm incredibly honored uh, uh, that, that IAL is opening this, this semester and this uh, new age uh, for GSAP. And I will pass it to uh, Laura that will do a formal introduction this session. Thanks. Where is Andres? I can't see. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so, Eyal, I can't think of a, of a better person to be hosting as our first speaker, both for the program that I've just launched and for, and for Andres as well. So, um, really happy that this happy coincidence happened. Um, so, um, so this is the formal introduction. Um, Eyal founded and runs what is by now quite a large and influential practice, forensic architecture. His awards and books are way too numerous to list in an introduction like this one, and they find, you can easily find them online anyway. So what is distinctive in forensic architecture's work is that, um, like Andres just said, they use the tools of architecture to intervene in very specific events related to violations of human rights and spatial politics. But they don't just take these concepts for granted. They ask things like, what is human? What are rights? And what constitutes space in the first place? Forensic architecture does very patient work. They make architectural models, digital, sometimes physical, synchronize events, and correlate those events with others. Their work has recently taken, uh, taken on the police in Chicago for the murder of the 37-year-old Harith Augustus, the Israeli occupation forces for the murder of Ahmed Arakat, a 26-year-old Palestinian at a checkpoint between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, illegal gold mining in the Amazon, which is destroying the ter territory and habitat of the indigenous Yanunami people, and environments of orangutans in the rainforests of Indonesia, which are being destroyed by palm oil production, and tons and tons of more projects you can view on their amazing website. So they use architecture to comment politically on the world. But forensics itself um, implies working in court, where evidence is produced by way of reconstructing the memory of the witness as well as the scene of the crime. They've done this over and over in minute detail in multiple scenarios. Even in the court, though, they offer a counter-forensics or a counter-mapping. They use the tools of power of the police, of the army, of the secret service, and more to expose those methods of violence and of surveillance in order to undo those very same infrastructures and violences. 
sometimes they succeed <laughs> in court, um, and sometimes they fail in the court of law. But in the court of artistic and aesthetic discourse, narratives and journalism, the influence is without comparison. Their methods have been replicated in the New York Times, The Guardian, and The Washington Post, and I'm showing my own bias here for sure. Um, and what doesn't work in courts works in other ways super successfully. They also have a massively um, you know, expansive artistic practice and display their work in museums around the world, the Venice Biennale, the ICA in London, the Whitney Biennale here in New York City, and many, many more. They often address local situations within the structure and funding of museums, like the Whitney Project, um, which led to the resignation of the board member, Warren Kanders, or at Documenta, where they highlighted the murder of Halit Yazgat in a family-run internet cafe in Kassel, Germany, where Documenta takes place every five years, or in Bogota, Colombia, where they, commissioned, where they were commissioned to exhibit work as part of the Clarification of Truth, Coexistence, and Non-Repetition Commission. So sometimes forensic architecture is commissioned, and sometimes they choose their own topics for activist reasons, and really an amazing body of work. Uh, personally, Eliel is a friend and an interlocutor. We became friends through our work, and we debate many things. It is a rare person uh, to whom I can say, <laughs> finally, uh, they have allowed pixels to be displayed at 31 centimeters rather than resampled to 50 <laughs> centimeters. And he would know exactly what I mean and what I'm referring to. We have a common language of pixels and their limits and discontents amongst other space-time artifacts. Eyal operates in worlds that require esoteric and hard to understand methods and techniques but his expertise is to make that knowledge understandable and sensible to many with very high ethical standards. The impact of the work unfolds in time and space for countless people that the works represents politically and aesthetically. He's also very brave in his work and ideals. So welcome, Eyal. I'm so happy that you're back here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such an absolutely beautiful welcome. And I, I feel very much at home here. Um, I want to start by saying to you all, or to congratulate you all, on your new dean. So not so much to congratulate the dean, but the, the school. And I think that you have the right person in the right time. Is that off? You have the, you can't hear? Uh, is that better? Hello? Yeah. yeah, better now, okay. Yeah, I think you have the right person in the right time. And also, I think I'd like to congratulate Laura uh, on the inauguration of your program, the computational uh, design program uh, that I hope will keep on kind of breaking new grounds uh, in architectural education. And thank you for the way that you've opened for many of us, Laura, uh, in your work to date and in what will continue, I think, um, is uh, path-breaking uh, practice. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to be here, but I'm ambivalent about being in the US. I guess after a few years of gap that kind of uh, were pretty comfortable uh, not to come here. Uh, a lot of it was consumed by, by COVID, but otherwise uh, was nice and kind of difficult to remember what it is to deliver a lecture on jet lag. Uh, so uh, if you start hearing my, my speech, kind of my speed and energy decreasing, that's, uh, that's the explanation. But the pandemic was also a process of evaluation, I think, for everybody. And we came back to a world that is very different from the one that we um, closed ourselves in a house from. And we returned to a different place on many, many levels. Uh, and I think that new questions have arisen and new agencies need to um, make themselves manifest uh, in a world. And, I, uh, and also that has been our experience in forensic architecture. 
um, when we opened the door of our houses again and, and, and gathered again for the first time in the office that was abandoned for a bit, um, we realized that many things have changed. Like Laura said, uh, our techniques have become a little bit more mainstream, like we can see them around in media, uh, we can see other groups doing that, um, we can see them being employed in, um, by human rights organizations uh, within, their, um, within their staff. It actually was really nice to be on uh, kind of advising the hiring committee of the New York Times when they were seeking to hire architects. And usually they would hire architects either to do some kind of renovation um, or to write maybe about architecture, but they were hiring architects in order to become journalists. So there's a kind of transformation. No? Architecture became an optical device, became a, a tool to see other things from, not that the that the study of architects kind of crashed onto the architectural object. Uh, so it's really wonderful to see both Washington Post and, and the New York Times hiring architects now. Um, but then what does, where does it leave us as, as a practice? Um, and how to operate in a field that has become uh, a bit more multipolar in this, uh, in this way? And one of the things that happened for us during COVID is that we came back into not one organization, but into a splinter of several. So we have now um, a little office in Berlin uh, called Forensis, named after the first exhibition that we had there at the Hakave, the House of World Cultures. Um, we've opened offices in Bogota in the kind of, um, the wake of the inauguration of our work for the Colombian Truth Commission and in recognition of that uh, effort. Um, we are working now on opening an office in, in Mexico City. Um, but the one that actually was very close to me uh, and the one I would like to start with is um, a little office we've opened in Ramallah. And uh, it is very close to me because I think you know uh, that I come from Israel and that a lot of the practice that later became forensic architecture started within uh, what is now called the anti-colonial movement in Israel-Palestine, movement that includes, of course, and led by Palestinians, but include also uh, Israeli Jews like myself. And um, I think it was, I don't know, 20 years when Mark, when he was the dean, invited uh, Rafi Segal and I uh, which was, I think, our first public lecture, uh, to present work on the architecture of Israeli occupation uh, in the West Bank. And I think that that preoccupation with architecture, human rights, and seeing how, as architects, we could see, perhaps, political realities that are maybe obscure or, or not fully understandable to other uh, frames of analysis and documentation, um, has begun. So, you know, in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a good return uh, to that. But our um, opening up into a kind of a constellation of organization was also an attempt to bridge a big distance, a gap between our office uh, in London. So, of course, if you come to the office, you would see that it includes people from not only many you know, journalists and coders and architects and filmmakers, uh, etc., lawyers. Um, and in London, about almost 30 of us uh, in a kind of a space that feels something between a, an architectural studio and a newsroom. You know, it has the kind of the, the intensity of a newsroom and the focus of an architectural office. Um, but um, still in London. And how to bridge that gap? We've learned over the years, actually, to be a little bit more like architects and actually work to commissions. Um, so we don't anymore do what we're interested in um, because we understand that entering the space of trauma 
of entering a, an event that is difficult uh, for family, for community, for friends, uh, cannot be done because we think it's interesting, because we know that something is in the news or important. So we work when we, only when we are invited. And also to be invited to do things, we recognize a kind of the difficulty that, it, that this sort of commissions and commissioning culture uh, operates uh, because who are the people that know of us? Who are the people that feel secured enough or confident enough to send us an email or an invitation to work? And uh, so we needed to kind of break our kind of like location and unitary structure and use the sort of like how we learn to work together during the pandemic in order to open all these offices. Um, in, in a way of work that we call very much open verification, a kind of big collaborative uh, investigation, not based on expertise, but oh, you know, in, in as much as it's based on expertise, uh, it is based also on the people that experience conflict and at the forefront of struggle, uh, and, uh, and they are kind of embodied uh, and um, uh, local knowledge of the situation. Uh, so weird constellation of practitioners that would include you know, those at the forefront, the lawyers maybe that were by, them si by their side, a scattered group of experts and sometimes curators that enable that work to be uh, presented uh, in different places. But when you do that, when you place the office at the site of conflict, these things could happen. And some of you I could see are smiling and know what that is. Um, last month, in the middle of last month, uh, on the night between the 17th and 18th of August, um, one of our practices uh, in Al Haq, a collaboration with the biggest Palestinian human rights group, has been raided by the Israeli military. Uh, Al Haq was raided. We are, you know, a kind of a unit within that. And the door, they brought a sheet and they welded it onto the door uh, of Al Haq. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So in the spring of 2021, we established the first satellite office of those that I um, talked about. Partnership with Al Haq, which is the largest NGO in Palestine. It's a human rights group uh, founded in uh, 1979. Uh, a group of lawyers, uh, mainly, but also researchers, uh, that work to end the decade long Israeli. Apartheid. In fact, they are the organization that termed, that started that campaign that ended with Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, accepting and acknowledging um, uh, the fact that Israeli ongoing domination in Palestine constitute the crime of apartheid. And, but uh, Al Haq also work in documenting human rights by their own government, by the Palestinian Authority that sometimes uh, with its um, corruption and, and also collaboration with the Israeli occupation forces um, participate in the domination uh, of their own people. What happened in October 2021 is that this organization was declared a terrorist organization. I think many of you have read it in the news. Um, it was not only them. It was a network of organizations uh, that was declared terrorist. Beside Al Haq, it was Adamir, dedicated to Palestinian prisoners. The organization Defense for Children International Palestine. The Union of Palestinian Women Committee. The Union of Agricultural Work Committee, as well as the research center, BISAN. Six organizations. Uh, we declared terrorist organization, and these organizations are the backbone of Palestinian uh, civil society. In the Israeli imagination, they were accused to be the front for the largest left-wing party in Palestine, a splinter group from Fatah, 
called the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, or PFLP, which is a Marxist-Leninist, at least in its origins, political party that has a paramilitary branch known for plane hijacking in the 70s. Um, nobody accepted that connection. It's not right, uh, perhaps only in as much as these organizations belong, generally speaking, to the left, uh, and the PFLP is a left-wing organization. Uh, but in this imagination of the occupiers, one universalist project, kind of international solidarity between left wing, sometimes guerrilla movement along the world, has morphed into a series and a network of human rights groups uh, in there. And a lot has been told about, uh, discussed about that um, morphing uh, that has uh, taken place. So what is criminalized is the act of solidarity and civil society here. Every case produced by these organizations is based on a big network of activists that exist and work on the ground within those communities uh, that they represent. When Israel sent the evidence for them being a terrorist group to the radical left-wing organization, the CIA, uh, it obviously echoed um, the fact that these people are not terrorists. Um, so why have they been declared as terrorists? Palestinians say that the reason is that these organizations that I mentioned, the six groups, are fronts, uh, or oh, sorry, are uh, promoting the investigation against Israel that is presented and culminating in the case being investigated now in the International Criminal Court in The Hague, right? Uh, a case that we in forensic architecture also have contributed to, and I'll show you work uh, that we've done on that. So problem is evidence, the collection of evidence, the collaborative civil society work of evidence collection have been declared a terrorist act with serious consequences. Um, most of the people we work with in Al-Haq have found malware on their phones, the offices are being raided, uh, attempts to cut their funding, and our funding is taking place uh, currently uh, as we speak, and every day that's what we have to spend our time mitigating, uh, finding new avenues to, find, to fund that. So evidence, evidence to what? And I think that it sometimes, and for my Palestinian friends, it sounds weird. What do we need to evidence more? What do we need to show that we haven't showed yet about the nature of the Israeli occupation in general, uh, its regime of domination? Why is evidence so scary? And how, in the way in which civil society produces it, there is other potentials for resilience and work in, that do not only validate themselves, and this is something that we've learned ourselves in forensic architecture, the validation of, the, of truth production, whether it's evidence or history, it could be a history of a millisecond or history of you know, decades, telling history is not validated by the way it is received or by the work it only does in court, it's the way it is produced. These organizations working together collaboratively with international actors that produces resilience and produces and becomes the evidence itself, if it is evidence, becomes evidence of the social relations that went into the production uh, of this work. And this is uh, the raid uh, over those. So in the early morning of the 17th of August, as I said, um, entering, breaking, like thieves in the night, um, documents, and then having the kind of audacity and arrogance to sit and kind of chill out in front of what is obviously on CCTV cameras before they've cut them off. So I think we need to maybe dedicate this lecture into those locked doors 
uh, in Palestine, those welded shut doors um, with those warrants kind of stuck on them. This is the uh, Bisan, the, the research center, and the agricultural worker center, and the health work committee, and the Dorf Ademir, and um, the order itself reads, in my power as commander of the military and by power invested in me from the emergency regulation continuously with my, declar with my declaration that Al-Haq is an illegal association and given I determine the necessity for security reasons, for the safety of the area, of the army, of orderly government, of good order, and as I determine it to be necessary for the prevention of terror activity, I order the immediate closure of this place as soon as this order has been delivered and it's keeping shut. By the way, nobody in the world accepted that, um, and, but condemnation did not arrive. And in fact, if there's any consequences it's to, to these organizations and to the people that also we employ uh, in those areas. Only that it took few minutes and the main entrance was opened and the organization staff and our kind of the forensic architecture unit there, I was back at work uh, on the same day, uh, producing work uh, that is going to go um, to um, um, The Hague, if that is what is, uh, is being chosen and um, the first investigation has already been uh, published and added. Uh, to the submission, and this first investigation was really about uh, clouds. So this is why uh, the kind of the cloud study theme uh, of this work. It was an attack, it was a missile attack on um, a chemical storehouse, targeting that chemical storehouse and producing uh, a kind of like a chemical bomb simply without throwing chemicals, but simply by mobilizing combination of wind and whatever was stored uh, in this place. Cloud studies. So I thought to speak about clouds uh, and um, to actually kind of choose a number of projects that we've done over the years in order not so much to um, show you the work that we are most known for, kinetic violence, um, police murders uh, and brutality uh, and other such things, but to look at the limit of forensics and through that also to the limit of the perhaps architectural imagination. So clouds, um, thought about clouds uh, is thought about the atmosphere. Uh, it's thought about what is a limit of an object and how to represent objects. What is the limit of violence? How to understand violence, not as a relation, as a line that connect only uh, two points. And this thing came, uh, the idea really goes back to one very early memory that I had in one of the early Israeli attacks on Gaza in 2008. Um, it was before forensic architecture was uh, established and uh, I was helping an organization uh, based in Palestine, uh, in the, but not in Gaza, to monitor and call people uh, in Gaza to see how they were during the war. And I remember calling a person uh, on the ground and asking them, how are you? And they said something that I can never forget. They said, um, my neighborhood is turning from solid to dust. And the dust of homes is filling the air. And he was coughing and saying, I'm breathing in my home, right? So the home turned from solid to gas. I'm breathing in my streets. And indeed, one can think about clouds as architecture in a gaseous form changing from columns to mushrooms before dissipating into the atmosphere. Bomb clouds contain everything that the building once was. Cement, plaster, plastic, glass, timber, fabric, paperwork, medicine, 
sometimes even parts of human remain are mixed together with the vapor and hot air and create that moving object. So when there are human remnants in those bomb clouds, you need to see them as kind of airborne cemeteries of sort, kind of soft architecture lasting for eight minutes, uh, usually. And uh, the first time that we use that, and I go now to a project that I think some of you or many of you have seen, but I want to kind of to think about it in, this, in these terms, was when we needed to, when we did one of our first investigations on the Israeli bombing of Gaza, uh, we've received over 7,000 videos and we're working with Amnesty International, Al Mizan, Palestinian Human Rights Group, and they asked us to reconstruct one day, seven o'clock in the morning, August 1st, seven o'clock in the morning, August 2nd, from those 7,000 images. And you know that in our work, it begins by locating things in time and space. But of course, there was no metadata and there is no metadata on videos and images that you find online. And we didn't know how to locate them uh, in time. We were looking for clues, we were looking at shadows, we were looking at all sorts of things, trying to find any traces of physical clocks within the image itself. And uh, this is just the kind of, you know, sort of a typical sort of like uh, board of evidence that, uh, that we have. Until we realized we're looking in the wrong part of the image. The ground, we were looking at the ground, but actually we needed to look up at the air. Because in the sky, the bomb clouds, and some also meteorological clouds, were floating. And they were a kind of a giant physical clock over the city that allowed us to understand where uh, images uh, were taken. So in one way, you find three images coming from three different corners of the internet. And uh, you understand this is the same cloud. This is the same time. Uh, so you synchronize them uh, to each other. And then we started to build what we call the cloud atlas, kind of a documentation of each and every cloud shape that we could get, giving each one uh, a kind of uh, a name, a shape, a catalog number. Uh, so then when we see it again, we can actually build the sort of the architecture of the skies there. But somehow also when you find a video with clouds, it gives you more information than that. So this is videos that we got directly from the medical emergency services. They were driving on ambulances, which are actually like tuk-tuks, or kind of scooters with a, with a little contraption at the back. They were driving, because communication was cut, they was driving just directly towards the cloud. So that was the best and most useful kind of videos we had to work with because they always had the clouds um, in front of them. And then when you find the same in another place, you, you see that the distance between those two clouds is bigger on the left than it is on the right, that you can start locating them. You can start seeing on which angle and trajectory uh, they are located. So there's also three-dimensionally, there is a value in this form uh, of reconstruction. Then you had, um, there was one satellite image of that city, Rafah, uh, during that day uh, at 11.39. And so the satellite just goes over, um, over that city. And when it, when it went over, it caught one bomb cloud as it exploded. So we had the time for one cloud. And we knew that if we find that cloud on the ground, whatever we see in plan, if we find it in some kind of elevation, if you like, or uh, perspective, we could actually sync up the whole thing. Uh, so we went through and then um, found the one here on the left, 
um, we knew that's the same time. And then uh, we could actually build what has become our like Rosetta Stone, no? like cloud shape in relation to digital time that allowed us to um, move further. Uh, and then when we synced up the sky three-dimensionally, we could actually build the, um, the, the events on the ground, construct a timeline and understand what happened. I'm not gonna, you know, the, the material is in my book if you're interested. Uh, and you could see why, um, you could see that what, what exactly happened during, uh, during that time. This is really one of the very early investigations, you know, I mean, you could see already, like, we're not yet within the kind of graphics and uh, capability that, that, that you see more in more recent work. And then actually understood that um, building an architectural model and this is really where it emerged in this sort of kind of like cloud constellation is what allows us to locate each image now in space. No? Because here is an image of a hospital or a kind of medical center and we can see a bomb uh, right behind it matching the image into the model uh, is what allows the, um, the location. And sometimes you need to understand the fluid dynamics of those and to understand that the same cloud that you see from this perspective, you later see it uh, from, from another one. Um, so when you look very carefully and slowly at clouds, uh, you start noticing other things um, in the sky. And in this particular clip, we were shocked to see the bombs um, you know, several microseconds before it hits the ground and blow up. We wish we could have frozen it. These, this bomb has killed 16 civilian, uh, one entire uh, family there. And when we were showing those bombs to the lawyers we were working with, they said, could you let us know which bomb it is? I said, well, how? And, and actually having the model and having it in relation allow you to, to place, um, because when you know where they hit the ground, you're, you're, we were able to put a, a, an image and a grid behind them. And, um, sorry, I'll just play it, it's easier. Um, measure them and compare them to a catalog. And then we see, this is the bomb. These are the people that manufactured it. And a certain other line of legal activism kind of is opening up because it's, it's now based on you know, work with supply chains, if you like. I think that the idea of cloud studies and working with clouds uh, was very interesting for us because we understood going back to the history of cloud studies it was a very interesting moment historically where artists and scientists were working together to effectively build at the end of the 19th century the science of meteorology. Not that artists were uh, coming later to amplify, to aestheticize, but, but effectively the kind of sensibility to form and shape allowed a kind of a system of classification uh, to emerge, cirrus, cumulus, stratus, uh, almost as if they were plants or frogs, or as if they were like objects that could be grasped, whereas they were actually uh, the epitome uh, of transformation. Uh, but the idea of cloud studies and the attempt to capture clouds in the sky uh, by imposing all sorts of grids and forms on them. Um, through also, you know, this is, this is uh, drawings from John Ruskin in Modern Painters, a kind of an attempt to capture the sort of the, this, that is always transformed and the amorphous. Clouds, of course, change faster than the hand that drew them could capture them. They had to be imagined uh, not always uh, represented. And um, 
you know, work like Hubert Damish, that theory of clouds and other, are, are capturing that moment of the fact that one part of the painting, the ground, could be captured by the rules of perspective, ownership, object base kind of understanding, while the air above it uh, was still, so if the, the ground was in modernity, the air was still somewhere in the Middle Ages, somewhere about divinity and mood, uh, etc. Um, so, but these ideas and those early attempts to kind of to capture clouds uh, were interesting for us because we needed uh, to update them uh, to our own, uh, with our own techniques. Another thing that we learned about working with um, clouds is that they are also a condition of vision, an atmospheric condition, an optical condition. If you look at them from within, when you're situated within a cloud, it's very different than what I showed you, you know, looking at a photograph from a cloud from the outside where you could say, here are the object and here it how it is transformed. And this image is part of an ongoing work that we right now undertake for um, a huge community in London, the communities of survivors uh, and the bereaved related to the Grenfell Tower Fire um, of June 2017, where a huge uh, housing block in the center of the city burned with 72 people died in front of the entire city. The entire city, and I think anyone that drives from Heathrow to London passes through it. Uh, it, is, it could be seen for miles in every direction. Everybody got up that night with the news looking uh, at the tower being burned, but there were people inside. And those people that were inside, those that survived, were those that did not obey to the um, fire authorities' instruction of staying put. They, everyone that called the emergency services was, was told up until 2 o'clock, 2 a.m., to stay in their house. And those that actually um, managed to escape went, had to go through the thickest of fogs the experience that they had, the kind of the contemporary hell, was the stairwell. The windows were breaking one after the other from the temperature. And every time a window breaks, especially in higher altitude of the building, in higher floors, the air sucks inside the smoke. And the smoke, because the, the fire doors, the front doors of the building were not closed secure enough, into the stairwell. So the stairwell was this kind of column of smoke uh, in which people were moving through, uh, hardly seeing anything. Working with the community on the, on, the, on the civil claim, in fact, one of the biggest sort of class acts in actions in, in, in British history had to reconstruct the pathways of dozens of those uh, people that survived their experience of walking through. And very often the testimony in this most horrible situation, moving through this fog, um, is obscured, A, by the obstruction. There is nothing to hold on to. You, know, you just walk through that kind of fog, but things happen within there. People moving up, the people moving down, you encounter people in there, you've seen people that later have passed within that event. Um, and, um, and, and this is the reason that we were asked to use one of the techniques that we have developed that we call situated testimony, in which we reconstruct with victims the uh, experience that they encountered in front of models, very technical process, just building, choosing the thickness of the smoke or the object at any given moment in the hope that doing that would allow memories that are unavailable to people to erupt uh, and emerge. Uh, and this is 
just one image in which the kind of the fog or modeling of fog became a kind of mnemonic uh, technique uh, within that uh, process. Very young now here. Then I kind of closed the door, I was the door and I kind of stuck my head out, hello, hello. Nobody was like really there. Um, and then the smoke comes into the corridor and everything. But after I closed the door, it was much more of a haze rather than I could see everything. I could see the light and everything, but it was in this section here. So again, these are not representations. This is not like post-production. These are being made in order for people to view and enter into the, the logic of, of the event. And then I remember coming down one part and I first of all I thought there must be a, a hose pipe, a water hose pipe, because I stepped on something, but, you know, there's bodies in the... Sorry, take your time. You know, you know but I thought I stepped on, like, hose pipes in the, in the stairwell. Mm. But, they, you know, you can't see. You didn't. I didn't see anybody. I didn't hear anybody else. You know, but, you know, you're stepping on, you stepped on somebody or something. I just thought it was... Originally it was... I'm going to stop that, but I think you understand that... Uh, Nicholas Burton, in this moment, is reconnected with something he experienced and have not fully understood what it was, what he stepped on through the haze as going down. And um, it was a, a moment that also for him at that moment uh, has been incredibly gratifying later because he has kind of uncovered that root of the, the thing that bothered him about the way down, which he did not fully acknowledge, he did not fully kind of like, he couldn't word it, uh, and, and that came out in that uh, process. Another work that I want to show you is a work that um, has been led by one of our members, uh, Imani Jacqueline Brown, who comes from Louisiana, was, uh, grew up uh, in what is called Cancer Alley, uh, or ne next to it. Uh, she actually grew up in, um, in, Louis in um, uh, New Orleans, but um, between Baton Rouge and New Orleans is uh, the site of, um, with, a, with the highest density of gas pollution, um, uh, factories, refineries, petrochemical, um, uh, factories over there um, that are stopping actively any research being done and lobbying continuously um, against science of the direct and quite obvious connection between the massive pollution of those, these areas and the level of cancer there. Um, so this is, this is the area and um, we have been able to simulate the dispersion of different chemicals uh, within that on the majority black communities along um, Cancer Alley. Uh, these people are also descendant of uh, enslaved people that lived in these plantations. And Imani, um, in her work, was trying to mobilize the history of uh, and to uncover the history of those plantations in this area in order to be able to stop uh, that and to put different difficulties in front of new, at least, planning uh, requests for new, for new factories there. And the, the way it was done is through mapping out uh, cemeteries uh, of enslaved people that remained within, uh, within the area uh, by either by identifying uh, here the kind of like what is called cartographic regression, um, knowing where, where they are in order to stop those uh, planning applications and actually creating a certain predictive model that allowed to identify at least 150 sites 
in which there is a high probability uh, of a cemetery uh, within this zone. Uh, and that's, that actually um, was presented in court um, earlier this year, uh, and we're going to see how, how it's going to affect uh, uh, that, that the attempt to stop these uh, processes. Back in Palestine, um, this is a um, typical image, typical day in the West Bank, so to say. Uh, Nabi Saleh, uh, a demonstration, not too big, um, going towards Israeli soldiers um, that are lined up uh, next to the wall. Beautiful landscape, beautiful day. Uh, and that cloud, that little bit of cloud here on the right-hand side of the image uh, is tear gas. Um, and in fact, the kind of the rules of the game are written. Activists are trying to get to the line of soldiers uh, in order to push them away. Uh, and the occupation soldiers are firing those kind of like wall of tear gas that uh, in order to, to get there, you need to cross that tear, tear gas uh, on the way there. Um, I'm standing, I'm not particularly kind of like um, hot-headed in these demonstrations, uh, but there was a, a young person next to me uh, who kind of, I felt, was a bit, you know, motivated to, to do that. And I was trying to stop her running. Um, and um, she started to run. I ran with her. Uh, I could see that soldier as I was, I was kind of like filming as we went on, kind of identifying us, telling this guy uh, to shoot, and he fires um, a canister, the canister of tear gas directly in her head. So we're just next to each other. I don't know if it's, it, it hits her head. Um, uh, then she shows the finger to them, etc. Uh, and that tear gas canister, only later, only years later, I realized uh, is the same one that was sold here, uh, not was sold, or the company was based here, uh, and that kind of connected to the Whitney story, right? So that was uh, a canister of uh, a triple chaser uh, produced by Safari Land. And the work, um, that it, it, the work and thinking we've done on tear gas also started with another uh, project to do uh, with roundabouts, with the, the way in which um, the countering of bodies in protest in space uh, coming in the sort of series of revolution that spread throughout the uh, Arab-speaking world um, within the early years of the second decade of the 21st century, creating a series of traffic jams, echopunctures, putting the cities under siege by pressing one point, taking over roundabout. This was the roundabout revolution uh, in that way. Bodies in that space, in those nodes of traffic, uh, were dispersed with enormous quantities uh, of roundabout. This is actually the Taksim Square that is no longer a roundabout, but still uh, a hub, and uh, the roundabout in, um, uh, in Manama, in, uh, in uh, the Pearl Roundabout. Uh, and then a work that we were asked to do uh, in Chile uh, in the, uh, during the protests uh, of the end of 2019, where again, enormous amount of tear gas uh, was fired and we had to produce a kind of a sort of predictive methods to um, understand the way that cloud that is only visible, you can only see it in the seconds after it's emanating from the canister, but actually exists in the air and on the ground uh, for months. Uh, thereafter, making it toxic, in this case, into the river, um, etc. So giving that shape in which cloud had to be mathematically produced. So another way of kind of understanding, uh, understanding them. 
And then, you know, into that world, this is the world that we faced when we were uh, invited uh, to show at the Whitney Biennale here. Uh, what year was that? That was 2020 or 2019? 18 already? Oh my God. Wow, 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 wow. And, um, it, you know, it started well before, well before us and continued well, af well after us with a group of activists actually occupying the Whitney when they realized that the vice chair of the Whitney board uh, was actually uh, making his money from selling tear gas uh, internationally uh, in different places. And it was also the time where the U.S. was using enormous quantities of tear gas uh, on the border uh, to Tijuana, uh, the so-called caravan that was coming. And again, you could see this sort of amorphous cloud breaking through and not really accepting this sort of Cartesian delineation of state boundaries, having its own uh, kind of territoriality um, in that way. But that was... That, was, that, that became understood, and we were uh, thinking that if we are to, to show there, and we were actually asked to show there our work on, on police brutality, uh, we wanted actually to, to turn the museum itself into a kind of a site of accountability. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain to this, it's an opportunity for me to, to discuss a few facts about the way that forensic architecture operates. Um, because we consider ourselves to be a counter-forensic practice, uh, meaning we produce evidence against state violence, corporate violence, um, the courtroom is only one of the sites of action, of activism, uh, of accountability uh, that we work within. Uh, whenever we get commissioned to do a case, uh, we sit with the people that commission us and we build a strategy that involves both sometimes, uh, not always, uh, presentation in legal processes uh, and then perhaps advocacy through human rights channels, uh, perhaps a truth commission or, or people's tribunal. Um, then we build a media strategy around it. So a media is another forum, no? The kind of the forensic in forensic architecture refers to the different forums that we will present our work. And somehow the art and cultural spaces started becoming important, maybe too important, uh, in our practice uh, recently. Um, it's kind of a reality that we were facing rather than anything that was designed. Um, we started receiving an enormous amount of invitation. We always thought, okay, the art, the forum of the cultural forums are great because they allow us to offset the problems that we saw in the court, right? Which kind of shrinks into its absolute technicality, the, the evidence that is necessary. So lawyers hate what they call dirty evidence. Dirty evidence is the excess beyond the legal apparatus that is presented with an evidence file. So there is, you know, think of it like, I don't know, the sort of the shard of, I don't know, clay or something, and the earth, that the dirt that is kind of stuck to it. It's unnecessary. You need to clean it up in order to present it. In fact, the dirt on the evidence, the political or any theoretical or commentary, big historical or locating things within history, is exactly what makes the evidence uh, fail in court. So there was this problem of dirty evidence within our work all the time and things that we were not willing uh, to clean up uh, from, uh, from the work. But what is dirt in one form becomes the decisive apparatus in another, right? So when you take a piece of work from a courtroom and place it in an art space, Exactly the historical, the political, theoretical, if you like, aesthetic, is what becomes operative. And perhaps the mechanical, the scientific is there, but shifts slightly to the background. And so for us, it was always a way like that of offsetting 
the problem of the limitation that we were facing uh, as political activists by presenting technical evidence uh, in court. So sometimes, some of it you can say in the media, but some things you cannot say in the media. The, you know, it's an impatient medium also. So taking a same piece of, it's, a, it's actually an interesting exercise. So take the same piece of evidence across five or six different forums and see how it operates differently uh, in each one and what becomes the operative uh, element uh, within it. But then you have to keep the dirt on the evidence with the risk that the dirt brings with it, if you like. And this is kind of like equivalent to the way in which um, contemporary archaeology, I just, we, we had a, I'm not going to speak about that today, but um, maybe in, in the future, I think, um, you know, I, I'll present that work. Uh, I'm working now with uh, a great uh, archaeological David Wengro, who's written with David Graeber this, you know, really interesting book on um, the sort of change from Paleolithic to Neolithic, the, the emergence of cities, no, like 7,000 years ago. And understanding that in that period of time, archaeology is something completely different, that what we use to think in archaeology, the, the kind of the, what is the most common word for archaeology? Unearthing, no? And what unearthing means, it's like you take an object and you clean the earth from it, right? You unearth it or you take it from the earth. But in fact, the earth itself is so informationally enriched that the signal is in the earth rather than necessarily only in the object. And the signal in the earth, it's magnetism, it's pollen, you know, kind of uh, density, uh, other kind of like components of its soil. I think this is something that uh, Hoche knows very well because he works with this sort of like reading, turning this sort of signal noise ratio in, in relation to dust and many other things, etc. So this is something that kind of like explained to me that problem of dirty evidence. No? In fact, the earth is a signal uh, itself, just like what I was speaking about in the clouds before. And in this period, in the kind of, when you, when you dig for the early city, not the great Mesopotamian palaces, but the very gentle city, gentle, gentle, gentle cities, light touch cities that were built in places like, you know, the, where, where the war now happens in, in Ukraine and in other places, you dig into it and it evaporates. There's no materiality to it. It's just matters of densities, clouds in the earth, if you like. No? And you can some start in, in them you start seeing forms, you can start seeing anthropogenic uses, uh, etc. Why am I talking about that? I'm talking about that because I wanted to speak about, about, about the court and how each bit of evidence operates. And um, so for us, the cultural space was like a safe space. No? This was where you know, after the battles that you did, after having all the schmutz in our face and scratching and all this kind of like things that go with, you know, you publish anything on anywhere, but especially on Palestine, you get the whole Twitter on you. And uh, we thought, okay, ah, now it's like open an exhibition, you know, having fun, drinking something, you know. It, it was kind of like our safe space and also a place to make the comments uh, in a way that was, we felt a bit more well received, but we never understood the fact previously that, that, the, that just like any other space, it, it operated to constrain and it itself could be, in this particular case, the instrument of oppression. Because that exhibition, founded by that, on that, with that board member, on that money, uh, is more destructive. And in fact, what there is to do, it's not about, it's not really also about, people think that this is about, um, you know, kind of like making sure that the funding is sort of like ethical or something like that. No, it's about creating sites of struggle. It's about identifying vulnerabilities uh, to people who violate human rights, to people that profit from weapons, etc. Uh, it's not really about, you know, that, that even based on any imag imagination that there could be 
you know, that, that we need to uh, have something like an ethical investment fund or something like that. It's like, it's ridiculous, no? Somebody enters the space that you can act, you act. And, and this is where, this is the way we were uh, thinking about it. And what we wanted to do was to understand in an immediate way, we needed to do a fast project. We wanted to know where this guy sells tear gas to. Now, unlike weapons, so if you make missiles, you need like Pentagon and all these approvals, you know, ta -ta -ta -ta. you need all this signature, and that appears on a public register. Uh, but what, when you sell what is called less lethal means, which is what gas is, uh, what, you know, rubber-coated steel bullets are and things like that, it doesn't. You don't know where it is. In order to know, we needed to search the internet. In order to search the internet, you need a lot of people. <laughs> so how to do that? So where... Uh, so, okay, we, we can hear David Barron actually explaining that. We took as our test case the triple chaser tear gas grenade manufactured by Defense Technology, a subsidiary of Safariland. Computer vision using machine learning begins by training a classifier to recognize objects in images. Bounding boxes and masks tell the classifier where in the image the tear gas grenade exists. This process usually requires a training set of thousands of images, but we were only able to identify fewer than 100 images of the triple chaser online. So, we set out to create a synthetic training set. We reached out to activists to find and photograph triple chaser grenades. An insurance claims adjuster named Mikol sent us this video from Tijuana. An artist, Emily Jassir, sent us this from her Bethlehem Art and Research Center, probably the most tear gassed artist residency in the world. From these, we created a digital model according to the specification. And I think, I think that, you know, like, uh, you, you can see just by two examples, no? Somebody in Tijuana, somebody in Palestine. To even to produce things that are very technical, you need network of collaborators in, 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 in front lines. So, you know, the idea was we, because we couldn't find a training set, we'll produce architectural models that will build us the training set. Uh, will produce all the all the possible variation. Would show those tear gas canisters in all from Set all directions. And then we use these patterns in order because that's our kind of like a, a developer is telling us you place an object in order to uh, realize the distinction between figure and ground. Uh, you need to um, you need to locate it in in that way. Uh, I'm going to show a, a, a sequence with a bit of strobing. If anyone has photosensitivity, um, which is also a good term for a classifier because a classifier is kind of photosensitive. It's like a, it's a way of reading photographs. Please don't look at the, at the next session, although it's beyond the threat. It's within the threshold, the legal threshold, etc. cetera. Um, sorry. Um, so... Effectively, the, the work itself contained a training set that would allow to identify triple chasers in the wild, meaning in the internet. So if you, a classifier, to, to create a classifier is like teaching how to see. And those of you that have children know uh, that um, to understand the nature of an object, to understand that this is a microphone, um, but this is also a microphone, and this is a microphone, and this is a microphone, and even if it's dirty, it's still a microphone, and even if it's broken, it's a microphone, it's a broken microphone, needs a certain obstruction. And, uh, and so you see through those obstructions. So you kind of understand how it is that um, learning to see operates, and to get um, classifiers, and today when we do open source investigation, we cannot do it no more like we did in Palestine in 2015 with the clouds that we've collected each one and tailored kind of like a, a model around it. We need a kind of a combination 
of uh, sort of machine learning and human researchers. The first step of uh, triage is by um, those things. And in order to do that, we create what we call model zoo. A model zoo is uh, a number of objects, different kind of objects that we look for. Uh, and then each one, you know, would kind of would quetch it, would dirt it, so we will show it from all directions, we'll create a classifier, uh, and then we'll send it out uh, on the wild uh, to do that. And the question is really, and, and you know, those colors that are behind are, you know, sort of randomly produced colors that are there in order to distinct figure uh, from ground. So this film became, at the same time, a film for a machine because it's the training set with which you can identify triple chaser canisters and it's an art piece, let's say, uh, at the Whitney, but also uh, a claim um, and a kind of activist um, sort of claim within that. And then you run that uh, classifier through on, on different... You, 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 you run it and then it sort of like it starts scanning the, the internet according to all sort of like hashtags and then it brings things in different probabilities uh, that are the object that, that one is looking for. And this is the future of open source investigation. Uh, I'm convinced um, that because the volumes that we're seeing, um, you know, when we started forensic architecture, shooting incidents somewhere, there were maybe th four videos uh, around it. Now, in events like the protests in Hong Kong, when we were working with a social movement there, you have, within one hour, several thousand videos, each one live, like you know, being put on Facebook Live or something like that, hours long. You cannot watch uh, those, uh, and definitely not, not all of those. Uh, and that also led to, obviously, to the resignation, I think. Uh, did you say that, Laura? Thank you for, for mentioning that. But more importantly, later, um, through the disinvestment, he disinvested from tear gas. So in a sense, for us, that was important because the art and cultural space was not a site to seek for accountability somewhere else, but, you know, kind of out of the black box or white cube of that, we wanted to uh, kind of direct it uh, directly into the... I, my PowerPoint is telling me I've been speaking for 84 minutes. Is that possible? Okay. I have to skip. Uh, so should I, I, I should stop, right? Uh, soon? Okay. All right. I don't know what, uh, what it is. If I have one more... Ten more minutes? Okay, I'll, I'll show then two projects. One that we've done on Pegasus, a collaboration with the Citizen Lab and Amnesty International on digital violence. But maybe before that, I'll show a work that we have just finished. And I mentioned the, um, the, the, um, the other kind of constellation of forensic architecture units when the war in Ukraine began, when the invasion began, uh, there was uh, a group that we really admired, really loved uh, in Ukraine called the Center for Spatial Technologies. I'm gonna show some of their work. Uh, I don't know who of you uh, know them. Uh, absolutely brilliant um, group of people. And I knew them at the time because they were working with our techniques and also seeking our advice on, um, and it was before the war, on a Babinyar uh, massacre site. Babinyar is a site that in September 1941, 30,000 members of the Jewish community of Kiev uh, were murdered uh, in and were covered within this Yar. Yar is a ravine uh, within the city and it became very well known that it, in the first days of the war, uh, there was a TV tower that was actually built on that site. It was flattened, um, and um, people didn't know exactly what was hit and, and, and how. And we were working uh, with them. 
So I'll show, you know, it's kind of, I'll start from the, the clouds that allowed us to actually uh, understand the relation between the images and somehow navigate uh, the space and understand what was struck. And now I will show you um, the work that uh, we have done together based on their work, on their previous work. Now that group from Kyiv is, um, we, we've been able to help them leave Kyiv. Uh, of course, women can leave very easily, but men cannot. Uh, and it took a couple of months uh, when, you know, they were encrypted working from, uh, from Kyiv and later from the mountains. And then, you know, in spring, they managed to cross the border and now they're based in our Berlin office. So, uh, and, um, and the idea of that, which is the idea of all the work that we do on Ukraine now, is not so much only um, to, we, we feel and they feel that in relation to the theater in Mariupol, um, in relation to Babinyar and other places, people don't know anything of Ukraine except of the images that we see now. People did not even know what Kiev was or what Kharkiv was. Maybe the architectural historians knew Kharkiv. Um, but um, so we use those strikes like needle probes. No? They kind of like enter the ground and become like, uh, like, you know, sort of like needle probes that allow us to see something of the, of the history. It, Particularly with, with Babinyar, it was important to understand exactly what was struck and what wasn't, uh, but also um, to expose that, that bit of history in a, in, a, in a professional way using a kind of um, techniques that, that we shared uh, with them. So I'll show the, I'll show the, the video. So the two... Together the with topographic maps. <laughs> Sorry, uh, sorry, Maxim. I'll I'll narrate it. Uh, the, the the entire um, issue and the entire logic of the genocide that happened in Babinyar had to do with the topography of the site. So first, it was a deep kind of ravine within the center of Kiev, and this is why it became a shooting ground. But because it was later filled. The topography itself was the only um, lock, the only anchor with which you could actually understand where the photographs that were taken of this massacre were. Because today, the entire topography transformed. That doesn't exist. So initially, we needed to reconstruct that uh, exact topography as it was and has, as it uh, evolved uh, during that time. And then only when you have this topography in a precise way, you can actually start locating the images, uh, the historical images within it and understand what was the, where was the holding ground, where people were asked to undress uh, and where uh, they were later um, uh, taken uh, and shot. But after they were shot, after people were shot here, the entire topography was collapsed on them. So again, the topography has changed. The, the kind of the topographical changes are um, very much the logic. So here, everybody, 30,000 people exist here in this ravine under that layer. Uh, the entire topography is, is, is different. And we needed to understand those transformation in order to locate uh, the other images um, that were there. And then, of course, the, um, and, and this is how the entire ravine after that, uh, at the time of the Soviet uh, control of, uh, of Ukraine, was filled with earth and flattened. So nothing of that topography remained. And this is the reason that people do not know what happened where. I think, Andre, you were working on that. Uh, uh, on that project, okay, yeah, so it's a good, um, so you know, do you know the Center for Spatial Technology in yes. Maxim and others? Yeah, okay, uh, so they are, they are all safe uh, in, in our office in Berlin now, you'll be happy to, uh, to learn. Uh, another, I don't know, this is a bit, um, 
random now, uh, but you know what? Maybe I should stop uh, with this, and, and we, so we have some time for conversation. Uh, sorry for taking longer. Than Amazing. Uh, thank you very much for sharing all this uh, body, amazing body of work, but also sharing where, you're, uh, where you are now and where your team is uh, basically. And I have a first question that is it's really about the limits of perception and, and, and what that is uh, uh, operating as a site for politics. And this comes actually for, uh, there's two works that you were discussing at different moments. One is the clouds as very fast, let's say, realities that are difficult to perceive. And then the very slow time of the earthing that archaeology mm. uh, fell off, in a way, in the process. And I, I, you presented both as a way to, to uh, uh, question uh, the object or, or realities that somehow are in themselves difficult to characterize through the the perspective of the object. And those are the two sides where somehow politics are becoming quite invisible, or violence is becoming very invisible. And the work that you're presenting, uh, it's sort of trying to bring those, if I'm not wrong, uh, those sides for politics accountable somehow, or operating them mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, those realities can be uh, uh, scrutinized. And, and I. I, I wonder what is that that we uh, that is behind these uh, two moments of time that mm. are exactly the scales of time where architecture tends not to work, or not to operate, or not being able to basically uh, find a way to operate as a discipline. So I, 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 I get that I guess that that has to do with the attachment of architecture to structures of power, in the mm. way that your practice is is sort of questioning that or undoing that. And I wonder what, what it means when you were bringing these uh, images and uh, of the, uh, the ground as the site of perspective and this, the, the air as something that escaped the control of perspective. Mm. And, and well, this is kind of the question, the two times, the, the, the earthy and the airy as sites that escape the control of architecture and somehow the site for other forms of politics. Yeah. Uh, I think I think this is great. Uh, one has to think through this. I I want to start by saying that um, we have a certain kind of like diagram, mm -hmm. uh, temporal diagram uh, that that allows us to do this kind of navigation across time scales, mm -hmm. and we call it the long duration of a split second. Mm -hmm. uh, so whereas a lot of the cases of kinetic violence that we do, like uh, uncovering police murders or um, shooting, sniping, bombing, etc., they are split-second moments. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we would spend a year or two years on a second, mm -hmm. right? So this, you have this kind of like incredible sort of like condensation of time, you know? Um, but then you ask yourself, why does it matter to unpack, to unravel the, this, in such detail this, these moments? Mm -hmm. And I think that for us, um, okay, so let, 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 let me start again differently and then I'll connect. No, there's this sort of, or there was this debate, you know, like uh, you know, 30 years ago, maybe more, between the sort of the historians of the long duration, the sort of Marxist mm -hmm. analysis school, um, history beyond the human scale, beyond the decisions of people in power, princes and queens mm -hmm. and whatever, you know, and kind of it's a history of landscapes, a history of vegetation, of migration, of winds and water, etc. No? And then came, uh, you know, as a kind of as a critique of that, the sort of micro-historians, the Italian schools, said, no, we're going to tell the stories of uh, micro-history, not 
the story of people, but not of the important people, but the, the, the small people that are kind of being uh, bulldozed by, by history. You know? How to find a faint voice of you know, people, that, how, what, what records they live behind. No? And that was a, a kind of, if you like, a sudden variation of a postmodern critique of, of uh, the modernism of the Annal School. And, and for us, it's the way into that debate between, you know, long durational history and micro history is to say we do, actually, our entry point is always different, molecular history. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not even micro, it's not even the life of a person, it's like a split second. But you enter into that microphysics, into the molecular level of time, and you find within it, it's like a bundle of threads. It's like a bundle of threads. And then you take those threads and, and you start pulling them out. And you start locating an incident in a world of which it is part. Mm -hmm. And of course the incident has got all sorts of things that play within it. There's the city and it has its own temporality. There's the temporality, of course, of a, of a bullet shot, of a mm -hmm. sniper. Yeah, we work now on the, on the um, Israeli sniper that killed mm -hmm. uh, Shirin Abu Akleh in, in Jenin. Mm -hmm. um, you have the trees there. You have, you know, sometimes you have the sky. You have, you have different things of different temporalities within that moment. Yeah. And that kind of idea of, of extending, of placing an incident, of understanding how the shadow of history, how the long thread of history are kind of like really tightly bundled within it and open, opening it up uh, is something that is very important. But that needs labor. It doesn't happen automatically. Not every incident is one you can navigate across scale of time and space and, and moving across those decisions and moving and navigating outward of the incident requires you know, its own skill and own interpretive skill. And then connecting it also to the scale of the earth yeah. or to the scale of the environment. We do now work um, that I cannot show because it's not finished, but in November we would launch it. And it's an investigation that we do with the uh, Namibian um, the Namibian Foundation uh, for the commemoration of the genocide, the German mm -hmm. genocide in Namibia, mm -hmm. something that happened in 1904, started in 1904 to 1908. Mm. It's the first, uh, not the first colonial genocide in no, by no means, but it's the first um, time that terms like, um, you know, systematic annihilation, mm -hmm. of course, concentration camp comes. You know, from South Africa and from um, uh, Cuba, just, just, just before. But the vocabulary of, uh, of the Holocaust, if you like, of the German Holocaust, uh, is already written there. And we've entered into this analysis, working with our Namibian partners on it, and we realized that one of the most interesting transformation, because we work, you know, what we do, we take those, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century photographs, we locate them in space of different elements, different stages of this destruction, and we see very clearly that what has been transformed, we can only barely locate them by the, by the ridge, by the sort of the topography of mm -hmm. that, and what has been transformed is the environment. The kind of trees that grow, the kind of plants, the desertification, um, you know, the distribution of different species within that. Um, so, you know, you take those photographs of a moment of destruction, but they're also meteorological sensors, those mm -hmm. photographs, because in each cone of vision, you can map the distribution of plants, mm -hmm. and that contain information about the environment, if you like the weather or the mm -hmm. climate that was and is no longer mm -hmm. there. So the, here you have a kind of like two temporalities that are yeah. opening. No, you, you see something happen to somebody in the foreground, but in the background, it, this is like the, the, the earth around the shard. No, it's the background. And the, the traces of the colonial genocide in Namibia are written still in the landscape and in its slow kind of transformation. Without the genocide, that landscape transformation would not have been, you know, without explaining 
exactly how it went, you have two or maybe more temporalities that are mm -hmm. captured within the instant. Mm -hmm. And what is important is to navigate continuously across, across these scales. I want to ask a, a question, but then I want to open it up because people have been, um, I, I just I have a feeling there's going to be um, a lot of questions. But I was just, uh, just listening to your answer over here and, um, and thinking just about the incredible transformation in your practice. It's, mm -hmm. it's so much bigger. There's so many more cases. You do so many. Um, I was just kind of overwhelmed by the, um, all the different things you do, right? So there's this human rights and forensics, and then there's methods and accountability. And you often say you're doing something for a court, but it doesn't quite go to the court. It doesn't, doesn't seem so. And, um, and then, you know, when you, as you describe a lot of the projects, it's working on the project is so much a part of the work. It's, it's, it's so much a part of the work to, as you're working on it, to discover what the, what the project is as you do it, which is very unusual. So it's not, it's not only, um, it's not so much about the outcomes. And so I'm just curious where, where you, you know, and then your work is funded in, in so many different ways. So I think maybe what you uh, would call a commission, somebody else would call a grant, or, you know, that the work is funded, and through the funding it's commissioned because people know of your organization, right? So I'm, I'm just curious what you, where you, where you see your most successful outcomes, because it's not often, you know, the guilty, innocent of the court. And, you know, as your work has evolved and come so much bigger and done so many things, where do you put yourself in that uh, terrain? Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I think that one of the aspects that yeah. Uh, we're learning is, and it's, it's, it's again like, let's go to the beginning of the talk. Mm -hmm. no, I was showing organization declared terrorist group raided, stuff is stolen from the computers, Pegasus, you know, this, this mm -hmm. malware is installed on people's phone, and all those people are doing is collecting evidence. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a terrorist action Act. yeah. in the kind of epistemological wars that we are finding ourselves within. Mm -hmm. So it's not really like post-truth this, post-truth that, you know? This is a real kind of... Um, it's a new kind of it's, battle, it's, yeah. it's an understanding that, um, you know, when... You know, from, because from the point of view of, of the Israeli occupation, those groups should not do... Palestinians should not work on these things, you know. And sometimes they would even allow a human rights organization from somewhere else. But it does not allow, it does not evolve into agency. And I think that, you know, if you say that truth, okay, whatever, you know, it's kind of like the production, truth practices, let's say, is producing a commons Right? Like, like water, like air, I don't know, like mm -hmm. forest, no? The, the way we think mm -hmm. about commons. That commons is a kind of a metapolitical condition, you know, that is, that is held in place because there is a variety, a, a very wide coalition operating from a polyperspective, multiperspectival, and, and weave together a, a certain fabric. And that fabric can, can change, mm -hmm. no? But they, these people produce information about a particular aspect of Palestinian reality, you know, to do this mm -hmm. tradition of women, farmers, prisoners, you know, children, etc. no? I mean, those, those, those groups that were declared. And there is a fabric woven because there's a project of of describing reality, 
right? Mm -hmm. And the very description of reality becomes, all of a sudden, you start understanding, becomes a subversive thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's an imminent project. And, and this is something that actually really empowers me to mm. understand yeah, that the production of the reality of our world, no? like the, the, the huge endless project that is we all participating in, of describing the world in which we live, no? Just simply describing it and combining one description with another mm -hmm. is effectively a work that produced that commons and that whatever this dark epistemology that we're facing, the dark epistemology of colonialism, mm -hmm. uh, of you know, Trumpism, whatever, fascism, that we're facing, it's trying to cut it apart, mm -hmm. right? Trying to isolate <clears throat> that. Uh, it works on the interlinking between mm -hmm. that, that, that builds that. So for me, what is interesting right now is to think about the building of that description of the world, whether it is colonialism or shooting in the street corner of a cloud here or there, or how, how, how you produce that as community buildings, no? as, as a way mm -hmm in which, you know, just like when you build a building, there's a certain communities form around the people that actually construct mm -hmm. it. You know, a building construct the community that construct it, mm -hmm. in a good sense, in a, yeah. hopefully, yeah. in a hopeful sense. Right. But that is the act of building, you know, uh -huh. that is what is important. Rather than, you know, whether, you know, we've convicted some, you know, also, of course, that cannot work if you don't have the desire to, right, for accountability. So desire yeah. accountability yeah. is kind of giving you the, the trajectory, the direction, mm -hmm. but the validation is in the way in which this sort of idea of open verification yeah. operates. And, and, and open verification is something that is, um, that, that emerges now, no? It, it, because otherwise you have either the, the media is, you know, the mainstream media, they, they have, they, they work their kind of house, one of the houses that tell the truth, the university, the this, the that. And now, you know, look at the war in Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, where do we, you know, if you, if you want to know what happened in a counteroffensive or in that, in the, you know, like Twitter, people are working, like those kind of communities of mm -hmm. builders mm -hmm. are weaving together one sound file with one picture, they geolocate, they compose, <laughs> You know, they, they, they do work mm -hmm. of building from testimony and evidence and photo and, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. That's a good answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right, so other, should we, do you yeah, have Jenna? Yeah, let's, let's open it up. Yeah, any, any questions? Ah. Yeah. Ah, I forgot ah. something to show. This one there and this one what? there, right? What do you do want to show? I want to show something for Reinhold. Uh, so there's one question there, one here. And one, one here, here. Yeah. Steve. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Wisman, for your lecture. I'm oh, your mic is not working, right? Is it on? Yeah, it's working oh, yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Professor Wisman, for your uh, remarkable lecture. I'm an urban planning student, and uh, I'm finishing my thesis based on your book, Hololand. So, oh. yeah. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> Thank you again for the lecture for for elaborate that book even more clear. And uh, my personal question is uh, not very directly related to the lecture. However, after I see you use uh, machine learning and computer vision to uh, recognize the tear gas cans and the the, the, the tear gas grenades, uh, this question occurred to me like uh, uh, during the past years, like. Do you think the video games that related to the urban warfare have enhanced people's uh, recognition or not knowledge on urban warfare, or does it romanticize the urban warfare and let people less like recognize it? Like, for for example, I know you have a, a close relationship, like working with the IDF officers. And I have. It's the <laughs> IDF, like <laughs> yeah. So uh, so like, do you think like a uh, uh, the current uh, video games related to urban warfare have uh, given them better soldiers or worse soldiers? Like, thank you. I, I don't know. Um, I know that they're using computer games to train uh, people. Um, 
I was, you know, in one of our cases, I think also it, uh, many people here may know it, it um, uh, was a, a neo-Nazi murder in, a, in an internet cafe. Yeah. So uh, a Nazi perpetrator enters and murdered a um, German from migrant background owner of that um, uh, internet cafe, shoots him. Anyway, there was a secret service agent there, but while the murder took place, there were two people playing Call of Duty mm -hmm. in a version of Call of Duty where they were shooting Nazis. Now, they were shooting Nazis on a computer game so intensely that they didn't hear the gunshots mm -hmm. uh, where a Nazi was killing one of their, uh, a friend of theirs yeah. uh, at this moment. Maybe that is <laughs> what we have to say. <laughs> OK. Who was next? Yeah, Steve. <coughs> no, we have a mic. Hi, Steve. Hey, as you know, I'm a huge admirer and follower of every, everything that you've been doing for 20 years or, or so. And, um, you know, it's likewise impressed by, by this you know, expansion of your, your, your work. But I, I, I want to sort of ask some sort of underlying questions about how you, how you think about the institutions that you're operating in relation to and the, the sort of, um, um, I guess, the sort of underlying intellectual argument that you're, that, that you're making in relation to, to them premised on a notion of, of human rights is, is sort of an overarching sort of underlying th theory that there is a that, that there's such a thing as human rights that mm -hmm. institutions should enforce or that somehow you know this the you know the politics should somehow result in hum human rights being um, you know main maintained around the world and then you're sort of inserting yourself into these kind of mechanisms to try mm, to mm. hold them accountable to, 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 to that claim. And yet there's something sort of despairing to me about the, the sort of narrowness in, in which your, your approach um, can act with, with, mm. within this context, especially if you think about the Israeli context of, mm. you know, major work that you've done over the years mm. to expose the degree of in, injustice mm. and in, 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 you know, systemic nature of it. And yet you see sort of, you know, these sort of marginal, uh, you know, sort of exposure of information, sometimes large exposure of information having, you know, no effect whatsoever because of the, the, the fragility of the, the institutions that deal with human rights. So I don't. I just want you to comment on yeah. th those sort of methodological and outcome questions. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I completely recognize the limitations and, and problems in human rights discourse. For us, human rights. You know, when you when you are like in the site of conflict, and you know, you 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 reach for what it is that you find on the ground right next to you, the nearest stone. So that's the human rights is like the kind of the stone we pick to throw at the state. Um, uh, but of course, it has, it's not in itself, if, if you'd say the value is liberation in a particular context, and definitely in the context of Palestine, uh, liberation, inequality, human rights and human rights organizations are, you know, some of the most effective right now within this context and the kind of last line of defense against like, well, should I say outright fascism when actually it is already there. So I don't know if it's a line of defense, but the kind of like savior of some sort of dignity, but not, not exclusively alongside social movement, alongside protests, alongside other forms of struggle and resistance within that. In terms of the limitations of law, um, we at least feel that any forum that we present, any medium we present with it, whether it's university, whether it's a court, whether it's human rights, 
whether it's journalism, or whether it's art, is fucked up in a different way. <laughs> Massively fucked up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in our attempt is to offset some of those, <laughs> you know, inherent defects in each one, and lim what defect? Limitations, constraints, different way in which power operates on them and produce within them is by not being in each any one particular hand and kind of navigating mm -hmm. um, between those. Yeah. So the, the idea is not, okay, you know, a sort of rejection of the world and the institutions in it and kind of trying to find or even imagine that in critical academia we have a pure space to stand from, but to understand that each one constrains you. Each one is a different formation of power yeah. knowledge, yeah. you know, and you need to struggle with them and against them at the same time. If you show within the arts, you know, you need to help fight those mechanisms. And, you know, whether it is in relation to Documenta or in relation to our exhibition or on that work, Cloud Studies in Manchester, where we were trying to bring in things, led to the closure of our exhibition and then to its reopening, etc. Each site is a site of struggle. It's not a site that you can take for granted. Uh, so you, you, but I would, you know, if, if you would say, as, as I would say, sometimes we're too comfortable. You know, sometimes I go to cities, I don't even know, I'm going to see an exhibition, see like a forensic architecture piece in some this and that, um, you know, like <laughs> yeah. group show, and I think it's crap. <laughs> I think it's not, you know, and it's not, it's not always doing that work. Uh, sometimes it's too complacent with it and, and you know, we cannot, uh, you know, sometimes we make mistakes, we don't catch it on time, and sometimes we just become addicted to, because like any organization, we become addicted to the funding because we want to keep our labor, no? So we cannot like yeah. fluctuate. So in a sense, you become addicted to a level, uh, like any organization, to a level of funding and start making compromises. So and sometimes you need to wake yourself up and say, hold on, what's going on here? And with the art world right now is our main problem, not, not the human rights world that, you know, those human rights organizations are considered terrorists, etc. but just the complacency that has arrived with political act slash activist art and the way it is consumed and the way it is used now, I don't feel is where it needs to be. And I think that uh, we as an organization will have to evaluate our presence within it because I think it's gone you know, out of control uh, mm -hmm. at this moment. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yeah. Hi, uh, first of all, thanks for the lecture, uh, wonderful. Um, second, uh, I, I just can't stop to think about like, you know, the media and, and, and the use and the manipulation uh, that goes all around. Uh, we're living in a very polarized world and, and each side to manipulate the media in, in their own way. So, so I guess it's just how, how do you navigate that line, right? Where now anyone can just manipulate data and, and, and change it very fast and, and the natural, and the data kind of getting married together. And I love how you mentioned unearthing, but how do you unearth data? Um, I guess in the work, right? And, and you hold accountable accountability, not only to those kind of committing the physical crime, but perhaps kind of the, like the digital crime, which, which kind of takes me to like Facebook, right? And, and the whistleblowers, and I don't know if anybody watched yeah. the Twitter, right? What happened? It, it is not as much traceable, um, mm. but yet I think it has the, that same effect, um, yeah. both you know, socially and politically and culturally. You know, there's two things I'm kind of now, kind of like eating myself that I didn't show. One is the work that I showed, I said I'll show on NSO and Pegasus and kind of showing how architect, you know, like something that is so non-architectural, right? Maybe you could say everything is architectural, but like, you know, hacking of phones, uh, understanding like spatial temporal patterns in it, what it revealed and how it helped Amnesty and the Pegasus project and, and uh, Citizen Lab actually, you know, bring down this company. Hmm. Uh, so uh, I invite you to look on our website, sorry, or, or you know, you'd let me nip back what you want. 
But uh, second thing, I'm eating myself because I put a clip for Reinhold. I just, it's kind of like mm -hmm. something I wanted to show. It's something about football and I thought I should, I should show it to him. Yeah. How, how, it's completely not related to your question, but I just have to say that. I have one thing to say that I've, oh. and I've said it to Al before. He never uses the word data ever, ever, ever in any of his talks. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. absent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, why is it? I don't, I don't know. know. It's, like, it's a really interesting in thing. Yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's just not yeah. your thing. True. Yeah. True. 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 <laughs> so. Yeah. So, so that is this is true. And then, but I, I actually love this field of manipulation and fake and all this kind of like chaotic uh, way in which truth is being produced now, uh, the kind of the open way in which of truth production. I don't mm -hmm. think that the way to confront that like dark epistemology is to buttress the old institutions, you know, like to kind of like donate to the New York Times and, and make sure that those like pillars of our society are standing. I think it's great that they're collapsing and they're in crisis and something else much more imminent is emerging. And I love that field of conflict and I think that this is you know, has its own problems and its own chaos and its own manipulation, but it's really exhilarating field in which, you know, people do not consume but continuously fight over facts. And if you if you if you if you understand it, it's unparalleled the kind of involvement of people in factual research, in acts of verification, in that kind of description of the world around them, etc. And fighting with others is, is something that I, you know, probably there's some historical precedent, but I, I don't know about it. <laughs> and the thing with Reinhold that I wanted to show, I kind of said, okay, I'll put this clip in, I'll put this clip in, I'll put this clip in. Can I show it to finish? <laughs> <laughs> Just short. Or is that, is that more question? Yeah, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Should I go ahead? If someone okay. has another question while he's pulling it up. All right. Yeah. So the context is investigation we've just finished on another horrible racist murder uh, that took place in Germany in a series of uh, cafes where another Nazi, once again, next to Kassel in the same state in Germany, uh, has, has entered into that cafe and, and um, a series of cafes, in fact, one next to the other, and murdered nine people. And the thing was how those cafes were over-policed. It's in Hanau, Germany. Uh, the, the killing took place on the 19th of February 2020. How the police fucked up the rescue operation. Okay, so they fucked up the rescue operation so badly, after knowing every gram of hash that is changing hand within this cafe, they completely lose the perpetrator. They don't know where they go, they don't know that. I mean, they have all the gear in the air, including a helicopter. And the helicopter footage became the, one of the most important thing in their case or explanation why they didn't find it. And we figured out something very simple, that the helicopter time code was manipulated, was wrong. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the right time mm -hmm. in the helicopter footage. And the problem was to find when the helicopter was flying. And now, I, I, I wouldn't go into the case, but imagine a case that depends on, the, a lot depends on when the helicopter is flying in the air, okay? You don't know when the helicopter is flying in the air. This is for Ryan. This is really for Ryan. <laughs> so, okay, here it goes. Now, where's my cursor? <laughs> is it? No. I cannot get my... Uh, That's great. It's like flowy. Like, uh, how to get... Ah, here it is. Okay. Okay. So, here we go. <laughs> okay, it's not that great, but it's for Reinhold. So, this is, this is the footage of the helicopter, and the time is wrong. And then what we do is, like, we realize we have a CCTV from the bar, and we see that there are two people in the helicopter footage, and you see the two people in the CCTV. So easy, no? So the time in the helicopter footage is the time in a CCTV camera in the bar where the killing took place. But it was also set wrong, the CCTV. 
And only thing that happened, we could see at the background a football game. And very faint in the background. And then we figure out what football game it was. And then we find the goal in the CCTV and in, in there. And the goal actually synchronized, because we had the Facebook live of that, synchronized the CCTV of the bar, which synchronized the helicopter. And imagine going to the German police and say, here's the right time, you, mother, you liars, about the thing. And here's how we did it. So that, you know, I just thought that kind of, maybe it's a good time to, uh, to okay.